Universiti Putra Malaysia accompanied by members of faculty. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for national anthem Negaraku and Putra Gemilang. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Assalamualaikum and good morning. Yang berbahagia, 
Profesor Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Saripan, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic and International University Putra Malaysia. Yang berbahagia, Profesor Dr. Muhammad Basharuddin Abdul Rahman, Dean Faculty of Science. Our honored speakers, yang berbahagia, Profesor Dr. Zainal Abidin Talib, Lecturer of the Physics Department, who will be presenting his inaugural lecture. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inaugural lecture ceremony by Professor Dr. Zainal Abidin Talib. To begin our program today, we now call upon Ustaz Muhammad Nur Hisham bin Nordin to recite the doa. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dan salam sejahtera. Ila hadratin Nabi al-Mustafa Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa sallam al-Fatihah. A'udhu billahi minas syaitanir rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Ar-Rahmanirrahim. Maliki yaumiddin. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ihdina siratal mustaqim. Siratal ladhina an'amta alaihim. غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا ونسألك قلبا خاشعا ونسألك يقينا صادقا ونسألك دينا قيما ونسألك عملا صالحا ونسألك خيرا كثيرا اللهم زدنا علما وارزقنا فهما اللهم ارزقنا فهم النبيين وحفظ المرسلين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم يا الله Segala puji-puji bagi Allah yang mentadbir sekalian alam. Selawat dan salam ke atas junjungan besar Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam dan penghulu kami Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam serta ahli keluarga dan sahabat-sahabat bangida sekalian. Ya Allah ya Tuhan kami, kami panjatkan rasa syukur kepadamu ya Allah, Tuhan pencipta alam yang Maha Pemurah lagi Maha Penyayang atas segala nikmat yang Engkau kurniakan kepada kami. Dapat kami berkumpul di sini untuk menjayakan majlis syarahan inaugural yang akan disampaikan oleh yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Zainal Abidin Talib. Ya Allah ya Tuhan kami, limpahkanlah rahmat dan keberkatan dengan sifat kasih sayangmu keselamatan serta kesejahteraan pada majlis syarahan yang kami adakan ini. Ya Allah ya Tuhan kami, Engkaulah yang memiliki kuasa pemerintahan yang mengatasi segala kekuasaan. Maha suci Engkau ya Allah daripada segala sifat-sifat kekurangan dan kelemahan. Mulakanlah hidup kami dengan sifat-sifat yang terpuji. Ya Allah ya Tuhan kami, anugerahkanlah kami kekuatan ilmu, iman dan kebijaksanaan untuk menerokai kejayaan. Jadikanlah diri kami insan yang berpandangan jauh. Komited dengan kehendak dan perubahan zaman Berikanlah kami kesihatan yang berkekalan Agar kami dapat bergerak aktif menabur bakti kepada masyarakat Dan negara Malaysia tercinta Agar kedaulatan tanah air teguh terpelihara Turunkanlah kami ke arah melaksanakan kebaikan dan amal soleh Serta kami memohon dipanjangkan usia Diliputi dengan sihat walafiat Menabur bakti dan jasa kepada universiti yang kami sayangi ini ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين تقبل الله منكم منكم تقبل الكريم Thank you, Ustaz Muhammad Nur Hisham bin Nordin for the du'a recitation. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to call upon Yang Berbahagia, Professor Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Saripan, 
Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic and International University Putra Malaysia, to chair and introduce the speaker for today's inaugural lecture ceremony. Please welcome. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Um, yang bahagia Profesor Dr. Muhammad Bashiruddin Abdul Rahman Din, Faculty of Science University Putra Malaysia. Our stool yang bahagia Profesor Emeritus Datuk Dr. Wan Mazin Wan Yunus also with us today. Thank you Datuk for coming. Uh, professors, senior members, management members of Faculty of Science, invited guests, lecturers, students, family members, any family member? Oh, Dr. Umi. Yeah. yeah, and uh, daughters, I believe. Yeah, um, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to convey regards from Yang Bahagia Datin Paduka Vice Chancellor, who's not able to be with us this morning, and uh, I'm honoured to be the person who's going to introduce Yang Bahagia Professor Dr Zainal Abidin bin Talib in this occasion. Professor Dr. Zainal Abidin bin Talib was born on the 10th of September 1960 in Batu Pahat, Johor. So you can calculate his age now. And uh, he's the youngest of five siblings. Following his excellence in uh, MCE, Malaysian Certificate of Education, he was selected to study abroad at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale, Illinois, United States, graduated in 1982 with Bachelor Bachelor of Science in Physics. He was then offered as a young lecturer scheme from University Pertanian Malaysia at that time, and received the offers to pursue his study for masters and PhD. He then graduated his masters in physics in 1984. Also at SIU, and later was accepted as a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Science, also at SIU, in the area of molecular science. Professor Zainal obtained his PhD from SIU in the field of gaseous electronics and mass spectroscopy in 1990, with a thesis entitled "Mobility of Sulfur Hexafluoride Ions in Sulfur Hexafluoride Gas." Actually, I just learned about this word just now. The one written here is SF6. Yeah. He then got married to uh, Umi Kalsum Abdul Manaf in the midst of his PhD. And uh, it was been emphasized here. That was the motivation for him to finish his PhD. <laughs> so I guess without that particular important event, we will not be here sitting and hearing his professorial lecture. He was also an academic advisor at the Blanket um, Laboratory, Imperial College, United Kingdom, 1993, and a JICA scholar at the Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, Tsukuba, Japan, during 1999 to 2000, and again in 2005. Professor Zainal began his career as a lecturer at University uh, Pertanian Malaysia, that time, 1991, yeah, still University Pertanian, and was promoted to Professor VK7, Uh, on July 1st, 2012. During his tenure in UPM, he has been appointed as the head of departments, physics, deputy dean, and later was appointed as the dean of Faculty of Science, October 1st, 2011. He was also selected as the chairman of the Dean of Science and Mathematics Council for Public Universities in Malaysia for the period of 2016 to 2018 and is currently a fellow of the Society of Solid State Science and Technology Malaysia. His services are not only limited to the university, but also to other government agencies and other non-profit organizations as well. He also served as the chief examiner for the examination paper assessment and a member of the panel of the curriculum review of Malaysian higher school certificate examination for physics for so many years. 
Professor Zainal leads the Electrical Properties of Metal Laboratory at the Faculty of Science, UPM. His research interests encompass a broad area involving phonon electron transport, dielectric physics, and applied optics. He has received more than uh, 10 research grants, including those from the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation, as well as from the Torrey Foundation. He has authored and co-authored more than 170 articles in various cited impact factor journals. He has also been invited as a referee, reviewers for many national and international journals, and also currently the chief technical editor of the Solid State Science and Technology Journal published by the Malaysian Solid, Solid State Science and Technology Society. Professor Zainal also is the recipient of many awards, either locally or nationally or internationally. Uh, such as the Excellence Service Award and the Vice Chancellor Award in teaching. Despite his he hectic life as an academic, Professor Zainal is also very active in co curriculum activities. He is a holder of the fourth degree black belt of Seni or Silat Seni Gayung Malaysia Association. So, a very bad idea to mess with him as well as brown bat for karate. He tries his best to find time to continue upgrading himself in the area that he liked the most, as well as teaching the young ones at several institutions of higher learning. His expertise in this martial art has made him the point of reference to the younger generation. In addition, he also liked to lend his hand to become a volunteer at schools and colleges in the, area, in the area of his expertise, such as he has spent many hours with school children at science camps as well as English camps uh, in the MRSM system. There is no doubt that Professor Zainal Abdin Talib has achieved excellence in academic and research as well as professional involvement in science, particularly in the area of material physics, as written in the inaugural book. Without further, without further delay, it is my honor now to invite and for us to listen to Professor Dr. Zainal Abdin Talib's inaugural lecture entitled Recent Developments in Selenium-Based Photovoltaic Materials. Without further ado. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, yang bahagia, uh, I thank you, uh, yang uh, Master Saramani, Dr. Yazid. Uh, yang bahagia, uh, uh, Timbalan uh, Nat Chancellor Akademik dan Antarabangsa, Profesor Mamak Iqbal Saripan. Yang bahagia, uh, Dekan, Faculty Sign, uh, Mamak Basharuddin Abdul Rahman. Uh, Rakan-rakan sekalian, ya, top, uh, faculty science top management, uh, ahli-ahli daripada Persatuan uh, Solid State Science Society Malaysia, ahli keluarga dan juga uh, hadirin-hadirat sekalian. The topic of my talk today is uh, recent development in selenium-based photovoltaic uh, materials. Yeah. Basically, uh, the title uh, relates uh, to uh, what uh, to the activities uh, that uh, we are doing uh, as a group. Uh, so, this talk uh, will relate to the progression of uh, the development of these particular materials uh, during this past decade or so. So, uh, the presentation overview would be something like this. Uh, present a very short introduction of uh, what we are as a Decker Characterization Laboratory in uh, the Faculty of Science. 
Uh, then uh, I'll talk about a little bit on uh, material synthesis and material evaluation. Uh, what are our future plans? And uh, later on, uh, conclusion and acknowledgements. So introduction, uh, material physics or condensed master. Yeah? Uh, basically, uh, my specialty is uh, on uh, material physics. And uh, what we do is basically we investigate or we look at the science of the material around us. Um, humans has been very curious uh, with the materials uh, around uh, for uh, their civilization. Yeah? And uh, so much so that they spend a lot of time uh, looking into the responses of this uh, material to light, uh, to electric, or to mechanical forces. Yeah? So much so that the fundamental understanding of uh, in this particular area have led uh, to the birth of a lot of uh, devices uh, that are very crucial in the modern world. Yeah? As you see, uh, the progress in material science and condensed matter physics have led to the development of the laser, yeah? uh, to uh, liquid crystal display. Uh, more important transistors, of which probably we would not have any computers today without them, and uh, low loss, uh, low loss uh, uh, fiber optics, yeah? and so on. So in uh, our uh, laboratory, the electrical characterization laboratory, of which uh, uh, Prof, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Wan Daud uh, was among the early pioneers in the lab, yeah? So uh, what we do is basically we look at the material, uh, we synthesize the material, and we evaluate the material in terms and find the interrelationship uh, between uh, the property of the materials and to relate them to the formal performance and also to the processing methods and to the fundamental uh, knowledge of that particular material. Among the uh, classes of materials that we have looked at uh, during this past, uh, since I was in uh, the laboratory, yeah? so in the initial phase of, our, uh, of my existence uh, in UPM, yeah? uh, at that time uh, the university was still University Putra Malaysia, and the emphasis uh, was basically to support yeah? uh, the aspiration of the University of Pertanda Malaysia, which at that time was uh, looking at the niche area of agriculture. So what we do is basically looking into agricultural products in relation to the uh, physics uh, and in terms of understanding uh, those materials in categorization them and so on. Yeah? And so we are looking more towards uh, palm oil, woods, and uh, uh, rubber and so on. But uh, as we know, uh, late in 1990s, yeah, there was some liberalization of the discipline, yeah, whereby uh, at the national level and also at the university level, there is more emphasis on uh, the uh, advanced material or the modern material application of which is very important uh, to uh, the world. Yeah. So there were a lot more grants that uh, was offered in this particular area. And uh, for us not to miss the bandwagon, so we have included uh, those kind of material. So we have expanded uh, our scope to include material that have important application in the modern world. Yeah? Among them uh, are, uh, still, uh, were and are, yeah? uh, uh, we have uh, glasses, uh, which I spent a lot of time uh, in that particular uh, area. Yeah? And uh, ceramics, clay, yeah? uh, while I was trying to find my way uh, in the academic world, yeah? especially layer double hydroxide in collaboration with uh, Prof. Zubey, who is now in uh, ITMA. Yeah? 
And uh, during this past decade or so, uh, we have looked into particularly on the uh, class of uh, materials of, or semiconductors. Yeah, because uh, uh, as we all know, yeah, uh, among the niche area of uh, uh, the, in the government uh, ground research is energy security. Yeah? So uh, we would like to work on the area that we are very good at, but at the same time, uh, we need uh, to have funding of which uh, we usually look or we have to be bold enough to cross or to be able to do work in the multi-discipline multi area so that uh, this kind of work or our work can uh, be funded. Yeah. So we look at materials for photovoltaic. Uh, why uh, photovoltaic devices? Uh, basically, in uh, the government national renewal policy, uh, they have a uh, plan, uh, they have focused on to have uh, photovoltaic as the main source of energy right through 2050. Yeah? So there is importance uh, in uh, doing this kind of work and at the same time, uh, there are also a, a lot of funding in that particular area. And what is uh, photovoltaic? Yeah. In a very simple term, it is a technology that converts sunlight into electricity. Yeah. Uh, if we can imagine uh, uh, light yeah, as uh, streams of wave packets, yeah. and if a material absorbs these wave packets, yeah, it can uh, break the bond uh, between the atoms. Yeah? So when this happens, yeah, you have free carriers uh, consisting of the electrons and what we call holes. Yeah? So electrons are the negative charge and the holes are the positive charge. Yeah? So due to the arrangement of uh, the device, uh, there will be an electric field generated. Uh, in the middle uh, between uh, the positive and the negative sides of the photovoltaic device. Yeah? So most, because of this, uh, the electron uh, and the hole, the electron have to move to the negative sides and the, the hole or the positive charge carriers are swept to the neg uh, positive sides. And so then uh, they will be collected uh, in the internal uh, circuits. And so you have electricity. So that is the simple, basic explanation of what basically we are doing. And uh, most photovoltaic uh, devices, or solar cell, as they you actually call, are made of silicon. Yeah. Uh, more specifically, uh, single crystal silicon. Yeah. And uh, they require a significant amount of raw silicon, but yeah, the good thing is that they are among the best uh, material to convert uh, sunlight into electricity yeah, with uh, uh, efficiency, uh, conversion efficiency between uh, 15 to 20 yeah. percent. Then there is uh, the polycrystalline silicon. Yeah. Although they have a lower uh, conversion efficiency uh, than uh, single crystal uh, silicon, yeah, they are much more stronger in terms that we can make uh, the material thinner yeah, uh, than uh, single crystal silicon. And so then uh, a lot of uh, design can be incorporated. And also there's this thing about uh, 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 the uh, miniaturization of the devices. Yeah? And uh, quite recently, uh, there will be a lot of work on uh, having uh, devices, uh, instead of using uh, single crystal silicon or polycrystalline silicon, uh, using tin film. Yeah? And 
of course, uh, the advantage is uh, very clear, uh, is that the thinner layers of the material will yield significant cost saving. Yeah? However, yeah, however, uh, as it is now, yeah, uh, the uh, conversion efficiency between thin film uh, and uh, the uh, silicon uh, uh, is very wide. Uh, the thin film has a very lower, has a lower uh, conversion efficiency. But however, yeah, in 1996, uh, they uh, have developed uh, a semiconductor compound uh, consisting of uh, copper, indium, and selenium, or we call CIS. And this particular compound uh, has achieved uh, energy conversion uh, or energy conversion efficiency of 17.7%. So that was in 1996. Yeah. And so it rivals uh, that of the uh, silicon uh, materials, uh, solar panel. And so that's another reason why uh, we uh, have uh, dwelled on uh, this particular material. Yeah. Uh, photovoltaic because of the national renewable energy policy, which requires that uh, the nation have uh, almost 70% uh, of its energy contribution from uh, photovoltaic sources. And also, uh, selenium is uh, one of, will be, uh, have, have been, or uh, will be one of the uh, material that will give us uh, the necessary uh, material for high energy conversion uh, from sunlight to electricity. And at the same time also, yeah, uh, this uh, silicon, uh, selenium-based uh, semiconductor have one of the most uh, uh, light-absorbent semiconductors. Yeah? Uh, 1.5 micrometers uh, can absorb almost 90% of the solar spectrum. So these are the two reason, uh, main reasons why uh, our lab have been doing uh, this uh, uh, selenium-based uh, semiconductor uh, research for these uh, long years, uh, between probably uh, 2000 uh, to current uh, time. Now, uh, what kind of uh, material synthesis or approaches that uh, we use uh, in uh, our activities? Yeah? Uh, initially, yeah, when we started out, uh, uh, there were not many of us uh, really understand what's going on, yeah? because uh, I was in mass spectroscopy and uh, gaseous electronics and want to know more about uh, 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 semiconductors. So this is a new thing for me. And uh, so uh, we started out very uh, uh, simple, very small, and we thought that we use uh, chemical precipitation method uh, for uh, this kind of endeavor. Yeah? Uh, so chemical precipitation synthesis, uh, it is written uh, in a lot of uh, uh, journals, has a simple and well-established wet chemistry precipitation process in which solutions of different ions are mixed to form insoluble precipitates. Yeah? So, but after doing this, I don't know what they mean by simple. <laughs> so probably simple just uh, refer to that we have a lot of uh, chemistry labs and we have a lot of chemists uh, at the faculty, and that's about it. So a lot of it is not as simple as it seems. Yeah? And uh, my first PhD students, uh, Dr. Josephine, which is probably in the audience, uh, sometimes uh, spend six to nine months uh, uh, without any uh, credible results. Yeah? So just uh, to learn about the chemical processes and the chemical reaction that are going on and to explain uh, is not as easy as it looks. But, of course, uh, we managed to do that. And uh, the system that we were, we were looking uh, uh, was uh, copper tin selenide. So that was the uh, system uh, that people are uh, focusing on at that time. So of course, uh, as I said, we do not want to miss the bandwagon, so we do, do it. 
And uh, so by using the chemical precipitation method, basically uh, we dissolve uh, selenium yeah, uh, to become uh, selenium ion uh, as uh, Se2 or as, uh, selenium trioxide. And uh, then uh, we, uh, we dissolve it in sodium hydroxide and then uh, uh, mix it with uh, uh, metal ions, uh, uh, metal chlorides as our source of metal ions. Uh, as we understand uh, the process, yeah, uh, we are bold enough then to try to synthesize a uh, ternary uh, compound. Yeah? And uh, to uh, synthesize ternary compound is basically not that easy, but it's not that difficult also. Yeah? Uh, what we do was to fix uh, the concentration of the selenium and fix the concentration one of the metal ion and uh, vary uh, the other types of metal ions. And then we look at uh, the kind of reaction uh, that was going on. So and how do you want to know what kind of compound do we have? We use X-ray diffraction. Yeah? So X-ray diffraction is something like a fingerprint uh, to materials. Yeah? Uh, and different materials will have a different uh, spectrum. So to identify uh, the kind of precipitates uh, that we obtain, uh, we, use, uh, we take the uh, X-ray diffraction pattern and, uh, and then we analyze and see what kind of uh, compound that we have. And from there, yeah, uh, we look at the optimized parameter, uh, and then uh, we use that optimized parameter and vary the pH. And uh, this was what the chemist was uh, advising us. So, <laughs> and they were right. Yeah, they were right, and we got a very uh, uh, pure clean uh, copper tin selenide as being depicted in uh, the X-ray uh, spectrum. Uh. So uh, once we have identified uh, the materials using X-ray diffraction, then uh, we would like to know whether uh, it contains the necessary formulation or the stoichiometric ratio of the compound that we intend uh, to synthesize. And so we use what we call the energy dysfixive uh, X-ray yeah? uh, to uh, look at the material. So this is a elemental technique which would give us uh, what kind of material, uh, what kind of element uh, that is in the material and what are their proportion in relation to one another. Yeah? So uh, the results uh, from uh, energy dispersive X-ray, or we usually call it EDEX, yeah, shows that uh, the proportion of uh, copper uh, and tin and selenium was at the right stoichiometric ratio that we intended to have. Yeah? And uh, we also would like to know yeah, whether uh, what kind of uh, precipitate that we have. Yeah? And to do that, uh, we use what we call a field emission scanning electron microscope, FESAM. Yeah? So there's a wonderful instrument in ITMA yeah, that uh, we have used. Yeah? And from there, we can determine uh, the sizes of the particles uh, that uh, we manage to synthesize. And uh, from uh, the results, it clearly shows that the particle was in nanometer range. Yeah? So because uh, the average size was 36 nanometer. Yeah? And in order to support uh, the results uh, from the FESAM, we use another type of uh, uh, methods, uh, uh, which we call uh, the transmission electron microscopy. Yeah? So this is 
something like a microscope uh, instead of using light, uh, so we use electron. Yeah? So one uses the uh, secondary electron that comes out from the material, one uses the interaction, the TEM uses the interaction of electron as it passes to the material to image uh, uh, the material or to image the uh, topography of the material. Yeah? And uh, both of them uh, give us uh, about the same range, uh, about 23 millimeter. Uh, for the TEM, the average size was about 23 nanometer. Uh, so this is very important to us. Uh, because later on, uh, when uh, we do method, uh, material evaluation, uh, that uh, our calculation should confirm or should be uh, of about the same range as the experimental uh, values. And uh, we also look at the stability uh, of the material, in the, the thermal stability in specific. Yeah, so our X-ray diffraction uh, or X-ray diffractometer at the Faculty of Science is a very wonderful equipment. So I'd like to thank the Faculty of Science and University for providing fabulous infrastructure to do this uh, world-class uh, uh, experiment. Yeah? And uh, we can basically look at the X-ray diffraction at whatever temperature we want, in situ. Yeah. So we can heat up uh, the material and at the same time may, uh, take the uh, X-ray diffraction. And from here, we can determine the stability of this particular material. Yeah. So at what temperature does it decompose? At what temperature does it change uh, from a particular unit cell to another unit cell if it does that? Yeah. So... Uh, results from uh, this particular experiment shows that uh, the, our material is very stable right up to about two, 1,200 uh, degrees uh, Celsius. And another approach that we use uh, to synthesize uh, material is what we call the mecha mechanochemical solid state synthesis. Uh, so uh, this is another system uh, cadmium zinc selenide uh, and we use this type of approach uh, to synthesize in that we have eliminated any organic element in uh, the setup. Yeah. So this is basically a solid state reaction. Yeah. And uh, what it does is basically it's a uh, ball milling uh, process. It is a non-equilibrium uh, method that employs forced chemical mixing uh, to produce, uh, it also produce nanostructure uh, materials. Yeah? So basically you have uh, in a container, you put your powder and you put uh, metal balls, yeah? uh, a very small metal balls and you roll it. Yeah? And, of course, there are several factors that uh, you have to control uh, to get uh, the type of uh, materials that you want. Yeah? So in our case, uh, basically, uh, we, the variables that we chose was the milling speed, the milling time, and uh, the, yeah, th those two. Because the atmosphere and the ball powder ratio, the type of meals, everything we kept constant. Yeah. And this is the type of results that we have. Uh, again, uh, we use uh, X-ray diffraction uh, to look at the uh, property of the materials uh, to see whether first uh, we have a single phase uh, uh, compound. Yeah because we do not want any impurities. Yeah? And also, we look at the crystallinity or the degree of order of arrangement of atoms in the materials. Yeah? So in this case, uh, we have milled uh, the powder uh, or the mixture of powder in stoichiometric ratio that we wanted yeah? for five hours, 
for 10 hours or for 20 hours. It can go to 100 hours. Yeah? In our preliminary studies, uh, we have uh, done up to 100 hours to see what kind of uh, effect that would have on the particle size and so on. Yeah? So, uh, so the result seems to match uh, that of the system that we want, yeah? which is the cadmium, zinc, and selenium. selenium yeah? However, yeah, however, uh, there is a broadening in the peak uh, from 5 hours, 10 hours, and uh, 20 hours. Yeah? So again, uh, this broadening of the peak is not a bad thing. Yeah? Uh, because it indicates to us that the particles uh, become smaller. So when particles become smaller, uh, it has this effect of broadening. Uh, the uh, peak. And it's true enough, uh, if we uh, take this sample and then look through what we have another type of instrument, uh, which we call the HRTEM, the High Resolution uh, Transmission Electron Microscopy, yeah? uh, this uh, type of uh, mode in uh, the TEM allow us to look into the details of the atomic arrangement. And it's quite expensive. And again, uh, we have it in IBS. Again, thank you, UPM, yeah, for <laughs> the, uh, the support, yeah, for the support that uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, they give uh, to uh, the researcher here on campus. Yeah? And we see that uh, we have particles of sizes uh, between uh, 2.6 uh, to 4.5 or 5.3 and so on. So those uh, very small particles, uh, which we call nanocrystal, or sometimes people call it quantum dots. Yet another type of uh, uh, synthesis method that we have employed uh, use what we call a solid state reaction. Yeah. Uh, for uh, to uh, synthesize this particular copper, tin, zinc, selenium, a uh, selenite system. Yeah. So we employ a um, what we shall call a revolutionary method. Yeah. And uh, the this basically uh, the idea of uh, one of our PhD student, uh, Dr. Nodin. Uh, uh, so we were trying to, uh, again, uh, move away from chemical method and then try to free us from any organic uh, uh, effect or organic contribution in our system. And in this case, uh, we would like uh, to give energy to the compound or to the mixture of a powder, and, but uh, we would like to do it in a uh, free uh, of impurities. Uh, the environment has to be free of impurities and what better environment as the vacuum. Yeah? So to do that, we put the materials in uh, or the mixture of the powder in uh, uh, what we call ampules. Yeah? But the, the thing is, uh, if you have a smaller powder, a very a small powder, it just sucked the powder out of the ampule. So uh, Dr. Nodin uh, improvised by using what we call a double valve system, uh, which we uh, have managed uh, to produce a high vacuum in the ampule uh, with this particular uh, approach. And once we have that, uh, we then uh, put in a what we call a rocking oven, yeah. And uh, this uh, system was uh, patented uh, about two three years ago. And uh, once uh, we have uh, think once we think that it has fully gone the full reaction, uh, we stop it and then quench it either uh, in air or in water or in uh, liquid nitrogen. 
Again, we get wonderful results using uh, this type of uh, approach. And a lot of uh, the students uh, later on have used uh, this approach uh, to produce uh, their compound. And it worked almost every time. So uh, we come now to uh, the material evaluation. So there are other materials uh, synthesis processes uh, for other class of materials, so, but uh, we will just focus today on uh, what we did uh, in the semiconductor uh, materials for photovoltaic application. Yeah. So for material evaluation, uh, the first thing we need to look at the chemical properties, uh, sorry, the electrical properties of the system. Yeah? For a system uh, to be able to be applied in uh, photovoltaic or any modern application, uh, we need to characterize uh, the electrical properties. Uh, but for us, we really want to look at the fundamental mechanism of the charge carrier inside the material. Yeah? And to do this, uh, we have developed what we call a low temperature two probe measurement system. Yeah. So again, uh, uh, I have to give credit to my PhD student, uh, who is now also an academician, Dr. Josephine, for uh, designing and developing uh, this particular system. Yeah. And uh, so this is the result that uh, we got. Yeah. Uh, we managed only to get down to the liquid nitrogen temperature, but our present system now is able to get until 20 Kelvin. So it looks like uh, th this particularly shows the variation of the uh, electrical conductivity uh, as a function of temperature. Yeah? And we can see that uh, as uh, we increase temperature, yeah, the uh, conductivity increases. Uh, sorry, the elect, uh, electrical uh, conductivity decreases. Uh, if you know a little bit about physics, uh, you see that probably this has a similarity to that of a metal. Yeah, because uh, when you increase temperature, uh, you have lattice vibration, you have phonon uh, collision. Uh, most probably, impurities will come into play. Uh, and as uh, you increase temperature, yeah, the also mobility decreases, as uh, Dr. Wandel has always told me. Yeah? Yeah? So this will lead uh, to uh, the uh, decrease in uh, the electrical conductivity. So it follows uh, the logic of physics. Yeah? And as uh, we increase the temperature, yeah, since this is a semiconductor device, yeah, uh, the uh, what we call it the, the band gap, the band gap, which means that the, for the electron to conduct, it has to jump across the barrier, yeah? and we see that as the temperature increases, the uh, a lot more of the electrons in the valence band yeah, would be able to jump uh, to the conduction band, as in the case of an uh, intrinsic semiconductor. Yeah? So this allows more electrons or more charge carriers to participate uh, in the conduction mechanism. And this later on uh, add uh, to the increase uh, in the conductivity of uh, the electrical conduction uh, with respect to temperature for this kind of, uh, for copper selenide. Yeah? So this is a thing that we do. Yeah? We uh, synthesize and then we want to look at what are the fundamental mechanism uh, that happening, that occurs uh, in the materials. So this is just the observation to explain our observation, but we really need to quantify our observation. We really need to know what kind of conduction mechanism uh, that uh, is uh, for this kind of material. And uh, to do that, uh, basically, uh, we know that at higher temperature, at higher temperature, 
uh, electron can easily, uh, since this is a polycrystalline material, yeah, so we have a lot of uh, grain boundaries uh, in the material. So for electron to move from one end to another end, it has to jump over a lot of uh, grain boundaries. And for it to jump over a lot of grain boundaries, it has to have energy. And uh, the kind of conduction mechanism that usually occur in this case uh, would probably be a thermoionic uh, conduction mechanism. So basically, uh, we have uh, solved that problem in the low temperature, uh, the high temperature range. But in the lower temperature range, uh, we have to consider uh, a few more uh, uh, mechanisms. Yeah? Uh, and among the mechanism that we think uh, is the possible to explain uh, the effect would be what we call the variable range hopping, yeah? whereby uh, the electron, instead of uh, hop jumping across uh, the barrier, it hops from side to side. Yeah? So where does this side exist? Yeah? So of course, if you look at the band diagram, yeah? so below the band diagram, there exists uh, what we call defects or localized states. Uh, if uh, you remember back uh, your solid state physics, uh, you're not supposed to have any uh, states uh, between uh, the valence band and the conduction band. But however, if you produce defects, if you have impurities, there will be a localized states in between uh, the valence band and the conduction band, especially at the bottom of the conduction band. And so, uh, the electrons yeah, will be able to jump uh, from one state to another state uh, in the simplest term uh, and to move through uh, the material. So, so we have two different kind of conduction type yeah, that is occurring uh, in this particular system uh, for the varial range of temperature. Yeah? For the uh, lower energy, uh, we have that of the variable range hopping and for the higher temperature, yeah, we have what we call the thermo thermoionic conduction. All right. A another type of uh, uh, method, uh, uh, material evaluation that we use uh, to, uh, to determine uh, the optical properties, yeah? because if you want to use uh, the uh, material for photovoltaic materials, uh, you need to know what are the optical properties of the material. Yeah? So, uh, in our case, uh, among the instrument or among the methods that we use is basically the UV visible uh, spectroscopy, uh, which will give us the absorption curve at different range of frequencies. Yeah? And for this, uh, we see that uh, the absorption is something like, the, it's difficult for me to describe, but it's something like uh, depicted on uh, the screen. Yeah? So how do we explain the kind of uh, absorption uh, that we have? Yeah? Uh, we can explain that in terms, first we need to know uh, the kind or the range of uh, particle size that we have uh, in the system. Yeah? And uh, from our TM, from HRTM, we know that the size are really small. Yeah? And uh, for this particular system, uh, the size is between uh, uh, less than 10 nanometer. So we know that uh, what we call this effect of quantum confinement is happening uh, in the system, uh, in the, the particles. Yeah? So, Therefore, if uh, for those particles that have sizes uh, less than, I think some people say 15 nanometer, some people say 10 nanometer, but whatever it is, uh, those particles that are classified as quantum dots, they would have emission yeah, uh, of different wavelength for different uh, sizes. Yeah? So different sizes will absorb or emit uh, different wavelength. Yeah? So which means that 
we know the size of our uh, particles. And from there, uh, we know that quantum confinement uh, is uh, taking place uh, in the system. Yeah? So, which means that now, if we look at the spectrum, we can say that this spectrum is strongly size dependent yeah? because different range will have different size of the quantum dots. And therefore, you can see the different range of uh, our different characteristic of absorption that is occurring uh, in uh, the system. Yeah. So another point that we can raise is that the sizes that we synthesize are not just homogeneous. Yeah? So we have a range of sizes uh, between that of 2 nanometer and probably 6 nanometer. So those give rise to the different range of absorption in the UV visible spectroscopy. And uh, we can also look at photoluminescence uh, to look at the emission uh, of uh, our system. Yeah. So the excitation uh, frequency here is about 320, 320 nanometer. And so... Uh, from photoluminescence spectroscopy, we can see that uh, we have emission at uh, 354 nanometer, which basically corresponds uh, to that of the UV visible. Yeah. In addition, uh, we can see uh, this uh, from here, yeah, this absorption uh, or this emission at uh, four, centered at 427. Yeah. So this uh, can rep represent uh, the emission uh, due to the larger uh, quantum dots, uh, which is being supported uh, through uh, elect electron resonance transfer of the smaller quantum dots. So it has this kind of uh, dispersion. Yeah? But the one that we worry about is basically the one right over here. Yeah? Uh, basically, if you have that, that represents emission of a deep level, a deep level emission uh, due to probably uh, impurities or due to uh, shallow states uh, underneath uh, the materials and so on. So in order to investigate that, yeah, in, in order to investigate uh, the probability or uh, to determine the kind of uh, origin of this emission, uh, we use what we call uh, the uh, electron spin resonance. So in the electron spin resonance, basically uh, it will give uh, uh, what we call a signal uh, uh, coming from uh, paramagnetic defects. Yeah. And uh, from this defect, uh, from this uh, signal uh, from the ESR spectra, uh, we can then uh, model the spectra uh, using different kind of model. Yeah? And we can basically speculate uh, what kind of uh, uh, defects uh, we have uh, in that, that give rise to the emission. Yeah? And also from the ESR uh, results, uh, we notice that we do have some impurity uh, probably coming uh, from uh, the side of the wall or from the uh, metal yeah, of the balls uh, transferred because those metals are basically standard steel and at very high speed, some of it, a minute level, probably have transferred to our sample. Yeah. So, uh, from our analysis, uh, we can uh, determine uh, that uh, those emissions uh, came uh, from either cadmium or zinc or selenium vacancies and institutional zinc atom. Yeah? So, we can narrow down uh, those uh, emissions to this particular group of defects. And to uh, exactly know which one uh, of these is responsible, we have to have additional type of uh, characterization, uh, measure other type of metal, uh, material evaluation. Yeah? 
and we can look back at the X-ray diffraction and to see whether we have zinc uh, in our spectrum at the minute level so co to confirm uh, what we have uh, obtained in uh, electron spin resonance. Uh, and uh, to, uh, of course, once we have synthesized the material, the material will not be of any use if we cannot use it for uh, modern application or advanced application. And to do that, we have to uh, make it into thin films. Yeah? And we use what we call a thermal evaporation system uh, to uh, uh, synthesize thin film from the sources that uh, we have synthesized. Yeah? And the uh, thing is, uh, we noticed while we were doing this, yeah? we noticed while we were doing this, that uh, the photo response of the film that has least crystallinity give the best results rather than those with the high crystallinity. Uh, so we conclude that most probably uh, the defects in the system helps uh, in uh, increasing the photo emission, uh, or the photo response of the system. Yeah. And uh, this is uh, the, we use a photoelectrochemical uh, experiment uh, or to test our photo response. Okay, so this, uh, the, we can also, yeah, we can also heat up the substrate holder over here uh, to have uh, the uh, atoms uh, combined at the different uh, substrate temperature. So going back to my point just now is that uh, the least uh, material with uh, least crystallinity have a better photo response. So uh, taking uh, that particular point, we uh, propose a method of how to introduce defect into our system. <laughs> All this time we were trying to reduce defect into our system, but this time around, we wanted to introduce defect into our system. Uh, again, uh, all credit goes to Dr. Nodin uh, for coming up with this idea. Yeah. So, in during uh, the formation of the film, which was in vacuum, so if we can control the number of atoms that goes up to form the thin film, so, for example, if we have copper, tin, selenide, yeah. So the tin selenide, we let the tin selenide goes up, and probably we try to limit uh, the amount of copper that can goes into the tin film. Yeah. And to do that, uh, we hypothesize that if we can allow a gas, yeah, in between uh, that of the substrate and the source. And if we can regulate the amount of gas in between, so the atoms uh, that goes up will make collision. And from there, uh, we can optimize the condition such that only that of the atom that we want will be able to go through. Yeah? So that is uh, the short story. Yeah? So of course, uh, uh, Dr. Wan, Prof. Wan Daud, uh, Prof. Wan Mahmud, I'm sorry I have to modify your thermal evaporator. <laughs> so we have to modify it to include gas into the system. Right? Yeah? And, uh, and we have proven uh, that using uh, this kind of method, we have obtained yeah, uh, uh, a better photo response uh, than uh, the original film. If we just had, let's say for copper selenide, if we just had copper selenide, but now we introduce, uh, uh, sorry, tin selenide, this is tin selenide, uh, instead now we introduce copper or uh, in this case, uh, zinc, yeah? copper or zinc into the tin selenide. 
So it gives much, much better photo response than if it were just were thin selenite. So moving on, I'm trying to get as fast as possible here. I do not know why. Oh, so sorry, it's moving backward. <laughs> so if you think you are nervous, you don't know how nervous I am right now. <laughs> So future plans, uh, what are there for me uh, beyond the horizon? So there is one more project I'd like to finish <laughs> before I call it quit in UPM. Yeah? Uh, in that, uh, we like to speed up the process. Uh, uh, chemical precipitation method takes about probably uh, as short as a couple of hours, probably as long as 24 hours. Uh, solid state reaction can take one day, two days. Mechanical chemical, the ball milling, yeah, 100 hours, 20 hours. So we want to have a method that can take or to synthesize it in just minutes. Yeah. So we have uh, used uh, microwave approach uh, for this particular. Uh, uh, Endeavor yeah. uh, with a microwave assisted method, uh, you can have uh, more uh, volumetric heating, more uniform heating, yeah. more control heating. And uh, this is the kind of uh, setup that we have right now. But the thing is, uh, we just uh, have a domestic microwave where we bought it for 200 ringgit, I think 250 ringgit. <laughs> uh, but again, uh, with this kind of arrangement, we were able to get uh, the synthesis complete in less than 15 minutes. Yeah? The one that we took uh, for quite a long time, just now using the different approaches that I've mentioned. Yeah? Uh, we, the, the, we as early as as fast as 15 minutes, and uh, we can see that even after 30 minutes, uh, we still get uh, a single phase uh, material uh, for uh, the synthesis. And uh, using AFM, uh, we have opened up a AFM laboratory uh, at the Faculty of Science. We are able to measure uh, particle size right up to the nanoscale and even biological samples. Uh, if you have uh, bacteria, virus, uh, welcome to our lab. Yeah. So from AFM, uh, uh, we have uh, determined that the sizes is around uh, 20 uh, nanometer. Yeah. But what we wanted is something like this. Uh, so, and I hope this, uh, we'll be able to do this uh, this year, uh, or early next year, uh, whereby we can really control uh, the, uh, we can have a precise control of the power uh, that goes into the reaction. We can control the mode of the microwave irradiation that goes into the reactor. We can control also the, the direction of the microwave that goes into the reactor. And at the same time, we can have different reactors uh, in our system. So hopefully uh, it will become a reality uh, either this year or next year. And we are peeping through. We have not decided. We have not yet going full scale, but we are peeping through uh, what uh, uh, material uh, that are called metal organic framework. Yeah? And uh, we are moving a little bit away from the photovoltaic uh, application and moving to superconductors. Probably uh, this is the direction uh, that the lab will take. Uh, probably in the near future. Uh, what are superconductors? Supercapacitors is basically a hybrid between that of capacitor and battery. Battery, you can store power, whereas capacitor, you can dispense energy at a faster rate. Yeah? So supercapacitor is that uh, you cannot have a battery to run your car yeah? because uh, the uh, discharge rate or the, the amount of energy that you 
give uh, to the car uh, is very slow. Yeah? So you need something like a supercapacitor. And a metal organic framework is basically a material that have high surface areas, controllable structures, and tunable pore sizes. So we intend uh, to use uh, this structure of the metal organic framework as the structure for our electrodes in supercapacitor. Yeah? And that will give us a better uh, capacity, yeah? better power density, and uh, better energy density yeah? for the supercapacitor. So this is uh, uh, what we do is uh, basically we join uh, the metal uh, between each other using what we call linkers and we design the structure that we want and then we burn off uh, the organic part and we have this kind of structure for the electrodes. So in conclusion, yeah, uh, we have undertaken uh, work to develop greater fundamental science and engineering basis for the selenium-based semiconductor material devices and processing requirements. Uh, I've shown you the three types of the synthesis and the results uh, presented. So the presentation basically focused on the study of the processing procedure, the structural optical and electrical uh, thermal properties to find out the fabrication and design parameters. And for our future plan, uh, we are planning to develop uh, microwave reactors that are capable of uh, regulating temperature with microwave power automation. Uh, the keyword is automation. Right now, everything is doing manually. Yeah? For the synthesis of copper-based selenite nanocrystals, namely uh, copper tin selenite, copper ferrum, copper antimony selenite, and copper yttrium selenite. So those are the area, that system that are we are, will be focusing and those are the current uh, materials that our people are investigating right now. And finally, yeah, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of the important people yeah, that have uh, influenced uh, me uh, during uh, my uh, uh, during, during, uh, my uh, years as a academic uh, in uh, University Putra Malaysia. Yeah? Uh, first and foremost, uh, I am indebted to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala uh, for His blessing and guidance. Uh, we has gotten me to where I am today, Alhamdulillah, yeah? and who has made today's occasion possible. Yeah? I also would like to thank all the vice chancellors, yeah? the former vice chancellors and the present vice chancellors, who have given us the vision and the leadership yeah? for the university to be. To be where we are today, yeah? top-ranked university, uh, most innovative university in Malaysia, uh, number one in Myra ranking this year. Yeah? So a lot of things are happening. Uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellors yeah, for uh, giving us uh, the wonderful facilities yeah? uh, to do work and uh, the uh, academic programs uh, for, uh, to make us uh, visible. Yeah? Again, uh, uh, the former deans and the present deans, uh, Prof. Basha, uh, Dato' Wan, yeah? and uh, also Dato' Mat Sulaiman, yeah? and then uh, Prof. Sidi, uh, Prof. Uh, uh, who else? Yeah? <laughs> Uh, Mama Awang, yeah, uh, for giving us basically the space, literally and figuratively, yeah, uh, to do our work, and for being tolerant, yeah, and also for being people friendly, yeah. uh, and also the head of the department all the departments, uh, we have supported me while I was a dean. Thank you very much. And uh, all the staff of the Faculty of Science yeah, uh, for their hard work and innovation and uh, proactiveness uh, in making sure that the Faculty of Science 
is always one of the top faculty in uh, University Putra Malaysia. And uh, I also would like to uh, acknowledge and show my gratitude uh, to the funding agencies that have supported me all through these years, uh, KPT, now KPM, <laughs> uh, MARA, uh, which have paid uh, my school fees uh, during my undergraduate years. <laughs> <laughs> tak boleh tinggalkan eh? <laughs> uh, JICA uh, for sponsoring me uh, for about a year or so uh, in Japan uh, mostly for the financial uh, for the research grant uh, TORE also uh, and again UPM uh, for sponsoring me uh, to do my masters and PhD and for uh, providing us uh, with all the fabulous facilities uh, around campus, yeah? and uh, sponsorship and the sponsorship of research and travel grants from all the institutions, uh, gratefully acknowledged. And uh, I also like to pay tribute uh, to my supervisor, Dr. Mikola Sofoshenko, who I think have taught me almost everything, yeah? uh, from being a scientist uh, to being a good person. Yeah. Uh, these people has been instrumental in my uh, development uh, as an academician in UPM. Uh, Dr. Wan Daud, Dr. Wan Mahmud, and uh, Prof. Halim. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Josephine, Dr. Emma, and Dr. Ko. Dr. Ko came all the way down from Unimap. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, from being a pioneer. Yeah of uh, my sous vision uh, while they have the they put faith in me while i have nothing then <laughs> thank you very much yeah so it's uh, it's uh, really uh, 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 kick start my career in upm and of course uh, all uh, the wonderful uh, post graduates uh, amalina fasliana uh, Ibrahim, Hamza, Batul, uh, Era, yeah? and Samane, uh, Chan, Abdullah, uh, uh, Afarin, yeah? uh, Siti, Salma, Salmia, Aina, Chang, and uh, Dr. Nordin yeah, over there, uh, Cek Guchin, uh, Toponchin, uh, Jamila, Amirul, uh, Lo, and uh, uh, again, Mr. Ibrahim. <laughs> Uh, who is now my PhD student. <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, those three angels of mine, <laughs> uh, Dr. Emma, Dr. Josephine, and Dr. Kaur. Yeah? <laughs> and uh, I would like also uh, to thank uh, the organizing committee, yeah? people, uh, th those wonderful people from COSCOM yeah? who have uh, given some uh, who have given uh, the, uh, what do you call it, Puntukan, uh, yeah? uh, uh, to organize this event. Yeah? Pernabit UPM, they have been wonderful uh, in uh, making sure uh, that uh, I came up with the uh, to, books uh, at the right time. And uh, people from the Faculty of Science, as usual, they are wonderful uh, in organizing or in assisting uh, the, our staff are uh, academic in every way possible. Yeah? And I'd uh, so like to thank my parents, yeah? uh, Aminah binti Karman and Abdullah, uh, Abdul Talib bin Hakim. Uh, they are, uh, will be 90 years old uh, next year. Uh, they have sacrifices almost everything. And I don't think uh, any amount of money that can have uh, uh, at present, will be able to repay uh, what they have done for me. Yeah? Uh, for example, yeah. So while most folks in our village send their children uh, to sekolah kebangsaan, yeah, my mother sent me to uh, sekolah kebangsaan Inggris. <laughs> uh, so it's, I mean, she has the foresight yeah? even then uh, uh, to make sure that her children uh, uh, will be doing well in the future. Yeah. And uh, at the same time, yeah, uh, my father, who was then a police officer, yeah, police officer at that time, as you know, earned less than 200 and 300 ringgit. 
but at the same time we're able to keep uh, the family together. Yeah. And of course, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, wonderful, uh, my wonderful wife and daughter uh, who have uh, uh, stayed beside me all this while, uh, supporting me uh, and uh, uh, the love and the support uh, is appreciated and hopefully uh, we'll be able to be together to Jana. And again, uh, I would be happy if uh, 50 or 60 of you turn out for my inaugural today. But with this many people in attendance, uh, this, you have made uh, this event uh, special for me. So thank you very much and God bless you all. Okay, let's thank uh, Prof. Zainal for the speech. So, um, I guess uh, with that speech, remarks a very significant event in uh, Prof. Zainal's life. One, a very significant event during his uh, career here in uh, University of Putra, Malaysia. Uh, he has shared with us about the recent development in the selenium, uh, as well as a few things that he has highlighted during the con conclusion. Um, like, for example, um, he was uh, referring to the uh, three types of synthesis that has been used and developed uh, in his research, as well as, I think, uh, there's an uh, IP, intellectual property pattern, that has been filed. Uh, as a spin-off of his work. Uh, and uh, he has shown to us, uh, giving us some examples about how an excellent work uh, should have been done and should have been started. And uh, he has also shared with us about the value of having a very good postgraduate students. And I think he has uh, put all the pictures of his uh, postgraduate students to give appreciation. So... Uh, for postgraduate students, you know that you are actually a very uh, important uh, part in research for any researchers and uh, for any professors to do research. Uh, you are our uh, important figures. You are the ones who are going to help uh, the discovery of knowledge uh, in the areas that we are going to embark. So with that, um, I would like to once again uh, congratulate uh, Professor Dr. Zainal Abidin Talib for the um, successful presentation, a very good presentation just now. And uh, we really hope that you will be successful uh, in the future. And um, I hope that I will be able to see you again in the next uh, series of our inaugural lecture. I wish you all the best for your future and uh, that remarks the end of this series. Thank you very much all. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Thank you to yang berbahagia Professor Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Saripan for sharing the event and thank you yang berbahagia Professor Dr. Zainal Abidin Talib for delivering his lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, it marks the end of our session today. We would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude and appreciation to everyone with us today for the support and contribution in making this event a great success. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to invite Yang Berbahagia, Professor Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Saripan and the faculty's management to have a photography session and lunch at the foyer. Other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, also can have your lunch at the foyer. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you in the, uh, our upcoming events. Wabillahi taufiq wal tidayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.